Not slugs, George cried out. I couldn't eat slugs. Whenever I see a live slug on a piece of lettuce, Grandma said, I gobble it up quick before it crawls away. Delicious. She squeezed her lips together tight so that her mouth became a tiny wrinkled hole. Delicious, she said again. Worms and slugs and beetly bugs, you don't know what's good for you. You're joking, Grandma. I never joke, she said. Beetles are perhaps best of all. They go crunch. Ugh. You're not likely to forget that in a hurry, which may be why its author, Rule Dahl, is selling so many millions of books. After a distinguished career in the 1940s and 50s of writing savagely amusing stories for grown-ups, Dahl took to writing for kids in the 60s, and he's never looked back. That reading was from George's Marvelous Medicine, and its eight-year-old readership is probably much less squeamish than us. Children are basically much crueler than adults. They don't squirm if they squash slugs and worms with their foot, that sort of thing, whereas we would, because they are semi-civilized at that stage. <laughs> I suppose I'm partly like them, because I, I personally love the stuff I write for them. Rule Dahl's suggestion that he may be only semi-civilized runs counter to the known facts. They're impressively unexpected for a man whose public school boyhood at Repton was fairly conventional, and they've been well publicized, not least in his two autobiographies, Boy and Going Solo. When the war came, he was working with Shell Oil in Darkest Africa, and he joined the Air Force. He flew hurricane fighters in Greece and Palestine, and when a fractured skull disabled him for flying, he was posted to the British Embassy in Washington, where he wound up as a wing commander. There his first story was sold with the help of the great English writer C.S. Forrester of Hornblower fame. He formed friendships with Ernest Hemingway and President Roosevelt and went for a while to Hollywood to work with Walt Disney on a film about gremlins that wasn't finally made. Life remained eventful, not always happily, and he's even been played by Dirk Bogard in a telly movie which dramatized the disaster that befell his first wife the Hollywood star, Patricia Neal, who suffered two terrible, paralyzing strokes and was nursed back to health by her husband. Kay Webb, who was head of Puffin Books for many years, remembers her first meeting with this extraordinary man. Oh, I liked him enormously. I didn't actually expect to, because although I had books, uh, I knew I wanted them very badly for Puffin, and I knew they absolutely rang bells with the children. I thought there was a sort of toughness in them, and almost, it seemed to me then, a streak of cruelty. And when I met him, he was, he was such a family man. He was so incredibly nice and warm, and a, a friendly sort of mouth and friendly blue eyes. You'll have noticed his blue eyes when, in later life, he became presenter of his own television series, Rule Dahl's Tales of the Unexpected, which dramatized 24 of his grown-up stories. His short story writing began quietly enough with the publication of Over to You, which contains a lot of flying stories and a noticeably Hemingway-esque style of writing. His own voice is more fully developed in the witty, sardonic, rather kinky stories that make up his middle period in books like Someone Like You and Kiss Kiss. John Clute, who has a special interest in Tales of the Fantastic, sees a further development taking place in the 60s and 70s. In stories that appear in Switch Bitch, we get tales which are far more explicit sexually, far darker, far crueler, far more moving. At that point, he seems to have reached the end of his career as an as a adult story writer and have moved into the famous children's stories. I think with all good story writers for children, there is an Emperor's New Clothes kind of feel about the way in which the world is seen as it really is. In the children's stories, there is no pretense at all. We are there, our eyes are unblinking, we see what the child sees, and what the child sees is true. 
most of the adults have no clothes at all. That's one of the reasons why Ruhl Dahl is perhaps the best-selling children's writer ever. Only Enid Blyton, A. A. Mill, and Beatrix Potter, all now dead, could possibly rival him. A Sunday Times poll for most popular children's book of the century was easily won by Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which pushed even Christopher Robin into the minor placings. Yet he fell into writing about as fast and unexpectedly as he once pranged a plane into the Libyan desert, which was actually the subject of his first story. Digging around for the seeds of his talent in his childhood, I wondered if anything in his school report suggested that this active, sport-loving boy would become a writer. Well, they were not very good. <laughs> Don't forget, I was a very tall boy, and uh, most of the masters were very short men and so they didn't like me very much I don't think I was probably arrogant and uh, opinionated and I was idle extremely idle quite central to his now very busy life is his large sprawling family of which he's more or less the uncrowned king he lives with his second wife Felicity and a pleasant Buckinghamshire house, where at mealtimes a dozen children, sisters, nephews, nieces, friends and animals regularly sit down. The house is not specially grand, and Rule works in a shabby old shed. Two of his sisters, Elsa Logsdale, the younger, and Alfred Hansen, the older, cherish formidable memories and a nice family line in irony. He can be very difficult. He can. But I think the one thing he can't bear is being bought. <laughs> he was a marvellous brother. I remember he taught me to ride a motorbike with Edris when I was 15. And I used to pay him sixpence an hour to ride it. <laughs> up and down the lane behind our house. Loved that. And uh, he, he used to bring us presents everywhere he went, wonderful presents. It was uh, very exciting when he came home, he saw sacks full of presents. And he brought us the first, very first nylon stockings we'd ever had. In a way, war certainly must be the core of the family, you know. And I suppose it's having no father. My mother was widowed, of course, very young. And I think she devoted herself entirely to the children and the home, had no social life of her own. She was unusual, even by Norwegian standards, unusual in what she required in life. She was, again, perhaps she was very like Roy, I suppose, a bit secret, you know, a bit private. And Roy was what we called the apple of her eye. We always teased him, he was known as the apple. <laughs> but in a rather sweet way and I don't know what my sister thinks but I don't feel that I know the man who's writing the stories Ruel Dahl the family man is warm and approachable Dahl the writer is remote and enigmatic and often dips his pen into acid there's a darkness at the heart of his writing for grown-ups in which grotesque shapes are glimpsed behind the humor half-hidden nightmares that would delight a Freud or a Jung. Some ideas keep reappearing from story to story. A very powerful sense of the terribleness of cruelty between people, between generations. A sense that communities must be preserved, although he obviously doesn't believe that very many are going to be. A sense that sexual material is generally explosive and can be dealt with only with what you might call a ten-foot pole. A number of other themes come to mind. But every theme that he deals with is conducted as a story. Doll stories are like tales you hear in a pub, the sort of stories that you repeat as something you almost believe, certainly wish to believe, was true. Bribing John Clute with a drink, I asked him to imagine himself in a pub and challenged him to recount one of these tales. He chose The Visitor, the first story in Switch Bitch. Uh, in 1946, before the Arab-Israeli conflict, Uncle Oswald is traveling after an amorous escapade from Cairo to Sinai, 
across the desert. In the middle of the desert, there is a filling station where he stops to refuel. At this point, his car is sabotaged, most likely. Soon, another fancy car shows up with a Lebanese who takes him to his magic castle for the evening. At the magic castle, there is a beautiful wife and a beautiful daughter. Both seem to be enamored of Uncle Oswald, whose main claim to fame is that he is sexually irresistible to women and makes ruthless use of this capacity. Both of them seem to be ready to go to bed with Uncle Oswald. He goes upstairs into the dark. Eventually, one of them seems to come to him. She will not allow the light to be turned on. She is most amorous. He gives her a love bite to identify her. In the morning, both the mother and the daughter have a love bite. Or at least they have a scarf which covers what might be a love bite. He goes back to the service station with the husband, whom he thinks he has cuckolded, possibly. On the way, the husband says, of course, there is the other daughter I didn't want to mention to you, in essence, because it's rather embarrassing. Um, she lives on the floor that you slept on. She is a leper. Of course, only the most intimate contact could cause any kind of infection. That's the end of the story. Beautifully constructed. Since 1960, there's only been a trickle of stories for grown-ups, of which that story, The Amorous Leper, was one. Everything changed in 1961 with the publication of the children's book, James and the Giant Peach, with which Dahl began his challenging and difficult second career. There are 15 children's books now. Although they're brighter than the adult stories, with less pain and more jokes, one thing that hasn't changed is Dahl's jovial observation of the soft white underbelly of life. Dr. Ruth Glass, whose subject is the archetypal elements of children's tales, believes this aspect of Dahl's fiction is not irrelevant to his popularity. For the children, there's lots of activity, running, scrambling, chasing, flying, and I think the most important things, he deals with taboo elements. I mean, there's nothing so tasty as taboo. If it's naughty, it's nice. And if it's naughty and nasty, it's much nicer, and it sells. He's always liked to shock, and that's, I can remember that. He's always liked to tell funny stories, rather awful ones that you can't possibly uh, repeat, you know. And he likes, he does like to shock, yes. He's not as bad as he used to be, because he'd take a complete stranger, you know, and suddenly start saying things that, <laughs> I don't know, some people took great offense at. Ruled. Do children partly like your books because you're so good at describing disgusting things? You often describe particularly nasty people by their mouths. I don't know if you've noticed you do this. Well, I like describing disgusting things, <laughs> yes. I mean, it makes me laugh even talking about it, thinking about it. Uh, on the subject of mouths, uh, mouths are the most enormously expressive part of, of the human face. And, of course, it's mobile, too, which is such fun. And I think it reflects every emotion uh, that you're having. Certainly, if you suddenly become terribly afraid, the mouth will change. If you become lecherous, the mouth will change. You watch it. You might even see him licking his lips. Yes, mouths and beards too. I still remember the horrible bits of maggoty cheese that have been stuck for months in the villain's beard in the twits. Most readers are amused by all the deliberately tasteless stuff in dull stories, but not all of them. Kay Webb had some trouble in this area. I was working on a children's magazine in America, and I got a story from Roald, a new one, which I thought was an absolute, for the first issue, I thought this was an absolute winner to get a Roald Dahl story, and nobody on the panel would accept it, because they thought the children were behaving too badly and it was setting a wrong standard. Rule himself is a bit contemptuous of the editors, librarians, and school teachers who occasionally launch attacks on him. He can afford to be, but it's not really surprising. After all, there's a lot of potentially explosive material in the books, capable of all sorts of interpretation. Narrow minded prigs can have a field day, and so, with rather more reason, can Freudian depth psychologists. He's definitely got some kind of a psychological leaning towards oral satisfaction and relationships with the mother. And these come out in all his stories, I think. 
the people who have power in his story seem to be the, the girls, the women. The President of the United States mustn't tell Nanny he's eating. He's got a peculiar attitude to the women. They're usually baddies, aren't they? Whereas the men are weak, vulnerable, and childlike, and naughty, but nice on the whole. I think he likes the adult to be like a child too. There's always the child in the man. Oh, on the whole, the children are much nicer than grown-ups because uh, they're still moderately pure. I'm talking about children under nine. They're untainted by some awful sex drives and, and uh, arrogance and uh, things like that, you know. No, I, 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 small children are much nicer, although they are moderately uncivilized. I wonder how much Dahl's own life, especially his boyhood, has affected the outlook of his stories. This sort of speculation has to be a bit glib, but certainly Dahl has faced up to a fair amount of violence in one way and another. I did get the impression that he was getting a, a sort of revenge on the human race in a way, and yet his behavior towards the human race is admirable, except in his writing. But you see, he was very smashed up, wasn't he, during the war? And when you read Boy, for instance, when he obviously got beaten a lot and resented it bitterly, I think he had to write that all out of his system in some way. And he probably did it in these short stories without even realizing he was doing it. Mind you, the crueler, the, not the crueler, that's the wrong word, the nastier you can make the man or woman in the beginning of the book, the more fun it is to see them getting their just desserts. I mean, it's tremendously satisfying. Any adult novel you write, you'd be very unhappy if there was a villain all the way through who, who never got caught in the end. It's just human nature. I can think of at least one villain that you describe who never got caught in the end, Geoffrey Fisher, who later became the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was not, in my view, a religious man at all. He wasn't a man of God. He was a, a very fine administrator who uh, turned my school over some 20 or 30 years into a good school. But he was renowned for beating people very hard which I disapprove of strongly. It wasn't only that, it was a sadistic uh, ritual as well. He was a pipe smoker, and between each stroke, he would start lighting his pipe again, which kept going out, and while he was lighting it, he would be lecturing him, and then he would deliver the second of the 12 strokes. I wouldn't want to know or be friends with any human being who could do that, an adult, to a boy. The fact that he could rise to this position never did, in my view, say very much for the church. That's when I began to lose faith in it. There's some very justifiable anger in the way you're talking, and um, it seems to me I detect anger in some of your stories, though that's by no means the only emotion. Do you think anger is a cleansing emotion? No, I, I think it's a natural emotion for any, any injustice who in the world. I've always felt very strongly about injustices and cruelty. If you said, who would you like to be your friend or your wife or anything else, my number one virtue, I think, would be kindness. Simply that. Yes. Certainly the stories generate considerable moral outrage against unkindness, but they use black humor to do it. Rural stories may begin gently, but they have a sting in the tail, like a scorpion's. There is a link between cruelty and laughter. It's the old story about uh, a fellow slips and banana skin in the street and then falls down. Why do we laugh? Because the poor fellow has uh, come an awful crash. He's probably grazed his knees and his hand. He may have even broke his wrist. But the, our first instinct is to laugh at him. You'll even see it with stage comics doing a routine. They use cruelty, and then, and then they explode it. And you laugh from relief, really, because nothing fearful can happen. So it might be that particularly your children's stories, actually by confronting sometimes rather savage and dangerous things, good for kids, do you think? Because there is a catharsis, because they do explode with relief. 
Yeah, I don't think it's bad for them because after all, they're going to be confronted with life fairly soon. And I can think of nothing more dangerous or traumatic than that. You can't, you can't wrap them in cotton wool. No way. Both the violence of real life and the magic of fantasy play a part in the stories Dahl writes for children. Does something in the blood explain this strange magic? Rule doesn't completely agree with his sisters about this. His peculiar stories, sort of morbid stories, I think that quite a lot of the Norwegian stories read like that, to do with trolls and the dark winters, you know, and I think probably some of that comes out in him. I think it's pity he doesn't recognize a bit more how strong the Scandinavian is in us as a family. I accept it as being very strong. But um, I'm very English, you know, born and bred, in spite of my name. Obviously, I can speak Norwegian because it was spoken in our household when I was born, and my nurse was Norwegian. But uh, I'm uh, very English indeed. When it comes to lifestyle, Dahl is thoroughly English, and rural, upper-middle-class English at that. He's fond of gardening, though it was with that rather un-English flower, the orchid, that he won prizes. He loves good music, especially Mozart. He collects antique furniture. He put together an extraordinary collection of paintings by early 20th century Russian artists, and you could add to that the paintings he bought from his friend Francis Bacon before Bacon's work had really been discovered by the art investors. I walked through Rule's cavernous wine cellar, which is piled high with the best vintages of claret and burgundy. The sort of comfortable, convivial, cultured life that all these things represent plays a prominent role in his writing too, though often seen ironically. After all, the bed of roses has not been without thorns. Rule Dahl has plenty of scars, both physical and emotional. First of all, I must tell you that I look my age if you see me ambling about, because I'm, my body is, is very infirm. It's had so many operations. I've got two steel hips, which is the main thing that stops me standing up straight, not the spine so much. And last year, I, I had a very desperate uh, time in hospital with uh, three massive stomach operations which were non-malignant but they were still massive and I'm only just beginning to get over them and uh, my wife Felicity literally hauled me from the grave but old age no I, the only thing I, I would dread about old age is, is, is being incapacitated or being a nuisance to people and so in that respect of course there's a lot to be said for euthanasia but it's a fairly desperate thing to attempt. I'm wondering what advice you'd give to people about coping with grief. You lost a daughter, I believe. Mm -hmm. You had a son very badly hurt and brain damaged and his pram was hit by a taxi. Your first wife, Patricia Neal, had two massive strokes through which you nursed her. It's not been an easy adulthood for you. How have you coped? The only way I think you can cope is to try to but certainly bury the grief and not wear it on your sleeve and, and then to roll those sleeves up and get down to putting things right, whatever was wrong. In my son's case, he needed a, a shunt, a valve for hydrocephalus and uh, we managed to invent a better one out here. In my wife's case, we, uh, we got something going with amateur stroke volunteers and we've got 40 branches in the country now you know, so Rod had to be really tough with Pat. He, he couldn't let her stop for a minute. When she was tired and exhausted and hating it all, he still had to keep on making her think, making her walk, making her exercise. And that's what perhaps gets reflected in his books, the kind of ruthlessness, because he had to be ruthless with her. In many ways, he has always been what you would call a big man, you know, a man who could cope, or has had to cope. Perhaps, I don't know how you put it, but certainly when his daughter died, I can remember I came over that evening to see them here, and he was standing out in the shed, and he'd got a 
little portrait that had just been painted of her by one of the school teachers and he just held it down and he said, the face of doom. And that's all he ever said to me, ever, about it. It's a paradox that a writer so popular with young people should himself belong to a generation and a way of life that's disappearing. In most ways, he's perfectly at home in today's world, yet I discovered an undercurrent of sadness and nostalgia in his conversation as well as his books. Yes, there's a lot I regret and there's a lot I like. The regret, I think, is lack of, of discipline among the young, lack of good manners and politeness of young people to old, politeness of all people to each other. But the older, gen my generation, is far politer and more considerate generation than the present one, I think, on the whole. I don't know that anything has changed for the better. Everything has changed for the worse, if, if I really start to ponder it. Old-fashioned elements appear in the stories, if you look for them, though they're not immediately obvious in Dahl's modern-seeming, punchy approach to storytelling. There's certainly a lot of punch as well in his relationship with his readers. It's as if he's entirely short-circuited the literary establishment and gone straight for the jugular, or at least the heart, of the ordinary public. He's only ever received one literary award, the Whitbread, for his children's book, The Witches. Mostly, the critics have ignored him. I think Dahl, as a writer, through his entire career, which is now 40 years long, has constantly improved. He has constantly come closer to that magic realist vision. And it's a very interesting career indeed. And it's interesting, I think, as well, that literary critics in general, who tend to be theme-obsessed, find Dahl pretty well incomprehensible. They can't deal with his popularity, they can't deal with his switching of idiom, and they can't do so, basically, I think, because he is a teller of stories, and stories do not paraphrase well in most literary critics' attempts to make sense of the world and of writers. His stories have become truer and purer as the years have passed, and it is very interesting to speculate what he might well do next. Do you find anything odd or strange or unusual about a man now age 70 who can see so clearly with the eyes of a child? Just totally admirable. I don't think it is strange for an instinctive storyteller in his later years to tell stories to the audience which most loves him. Rule Dahl. Wry, sharp-edged, impish and alert. He lacks laughter and he also likes to shock. He can make startlingly personal remarks. And behind his brilliant blue eyes Something rather elusive and really rather strange, rather troll-like, sometimes peers out. He's a bit like his stories in that way. One thing I do accept is his sister's judgment of him as a dominant person. He is indeed the apple. Whether deliberately or accidentally, Dahl sums it up himself in his own words, both his life and his art. In the message he gives to all his readers at the end of Danny, a champion of the world. To children who have read this book, when you grow up and have children of your own, do please remember something important. A stodgy parent is no fun at all. What a child wants and deserves is a parent who is sparky. The Stalled Ox, the first of three short stories by Saki, read by Michael Cochrane.